look at a few cases, theories, and best practices in depth. In this one, we'll take a look at a case that I've mentioned several times throughout this series, but BP's 2010 explosion in the Gulf of Mexico as a case of how an organization can get all the actual messaging right and still not be successful. In unpacking this case, I think there are some vital lessons that can be learned about both the short and long-term crisis response and recovery. One of the hardest lessons learned is that with the BP case is that crisis response, especially when we're talking about serious transgressions and prolonged crises, is a long-term activity to rebuild public trust, and organizations cannot and should not expect that the right message repairs their relationships with stakeholders really quickly. We begin by asking the question, when is a firm in trouble? In this case, the answer is pretty obvious, when you can see their transgression from space. My research team tracked BP's responses from April 20th, 2010, when the Mercado well exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, to September 20th, 2010, when the well was officially pronounced capped and the oil stopped flowing. In all, this meant 126 press releases, 1,789 Facebook posts, and 2,730 tweets from BP at this time. What we found was that overall BP's response to the crisis was incredibly positive. It was accommodative, and let's remind ourselves from the last podcast that accommodative responses represent efforts to correct actions adversely affecting others. It can include announcements of recall or offers of compensation, communication of contrition, admission of blame, including remorse and requests for pardon, mortification, communicating concern for those affected, and offering assurances. In short, it's a pro-social response that focuses on correcting the problem, communicating empathy, and recognizing what the organization did wrong. In the overall mix of BP's crisis response strategies, this was the second most common response strategy following efforts to talk about the crisis itself. So it's safe to say that BP's focus was on positive pro-social messaging, and this came from all levels of the company. As a co-researcher and I got a bit of time and distance from the project, we started to consider the nature of BP's response differently because despite all the research finding that accommodative strategies lead to forgiveness and image recovery, we found that BP struggled with this. In addition to the traditional crisis communication literature identifying accommodative strategy across multiple theories like SACT and IRT, I also considered my theoretical focus, which emphasizes stakeholder relationship management. But Gus and I began to consider the ethics of crisis response to try and figure out maybe a more sophisticated way of talking about the accommodative strategy. So we began to ask the question, fundamentally, what's an apology? As we dug into the literature on this, it quickly became clear that there are many ethical frameworks to consider in discussing apology within an organizational context. So we drew on three. Two, atonement theory and the ethics of care came from a business ethics world, and one, the apologetic ethics framework, came from crisis communication. I'll take a look at these in a moment, but let me be clear here. This is not a heuristic that ha helps us to evaluate the intent of apology, just the content of apology. The first component of the model of ethical apology is the manner of apology. So when we consider the manner of apology, we can think about that in terms of the source, context, and timing of an organization's apology for a transgression. In particular, the apologetic ethics framework served as the basis for informing the manner of apology. Previous research on apologies indicate that organizations should first ensure that apologies in full are available across all platforms of their owned media. Second, develop a context in which the apology seems sincere. Largely, good apologies have to be sincere across topics related to this situation and across platforms. In other words, organizations can appear to apologize in one situation and then flout responsibility in others. Third, there's an important element of timing in the apology. Initially, it needs to occur early in the crisis, but the message cannot remain static. It must develop. In BP's case, 
the source and context conditions for effective apology were pretty clearly met, with consistent evidence of their apology across all their owned media sources and across most of the contexts in which they could have been talking about the crisis. Moreover, the timing of the apology was also relatively effective. It was used early on and continued to develop throughout the prolonged five-month crisis. So in our judgment, BP demonstrated a good manner of apology in their response to the 2010 explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. The second component of our model of ethical apology focuses on the content of the apology and what previous research finds is important that organizations who are facing transgressions should say when apologizing. The content is influenced by research findings related to atonement theory, the apologetic ethics framework, and the ethics of care perspective. So let's unpack what it means for an organization to properly apologize when they do something wrong. First, the organization must acknowledge what they have done wrong. Acknowledgement should have five components to it. First, specifically acknowledge what the organization's done wrong. This can't be just a we're sorry if people feel kind of statement. It has to be more authentic than that. Second, the organization should ask for forgiveness. Third, it needs to take steps to explain how to do things differently in the future. Fourth, it must express regret. And fifth, it must demonstrate its interest in reconciling with stakeholders that it has wronged. When it acknowledges that it's done wrong through these five steps, there's a chance that it can be accepted. Second, in addition to acknowledgement, ethical apology includes communicating empathy for those who are affected by the crisis. So to communicate empathy means that first, being directly responsive to the voices experience and situations of the people who have been affected. Second, demonstrating public atonement for wrongdoing. And third, communicating an authentic identification with the stakeholders who have been affected all communicates empathy for those affected by the crisis. And then finally, it's not enough to acknowledge and communicate empathy. Organizations must also demonstrate they're taking concrete action to fix fix the situation. This includes demonstrating changes in the organization's attitude and relationship with stakeholders, so it's re-earning their trust. Second, directly addressing to the stakeholder's satisfaction the legitimate concerns that the stakeholders have. Third, emphasizing responsibility to others and to doing what's right for those directly and indirectly affected by the crisis. And finally, demonstrating compensation for those affected, and that needs to be seen as voluntary, so communicating a sincere act, interest in action. So let's write how BP did in 2010. On the table, you can see very typical examples of how BP used response strategies of apologia, corrective action, and compassion to meet these requirements. What's important to note that these three examples were used by different organizational leaders and used right across the crisis, with the messages evolving as the crisis evolved. On its face, we should have expected that BP would have been successful in their use of apology across the 2010 Gulf of Mexico crisis, but it's worth taking a look at why it wasn't successful. There are three factors we can point to that explain, within the confines of this case, why BP's ethical apology failed. First, BP didn't do well in communicating empathy very early in the crisis, though they certainly communicated a lot of empathy later. Early on, the tone for the apology felt a bit hollow. Second, as I mentioned, most of the contexts where BP was talking about the crisis, they did use ethical apology. However, there were three contexts where they did not. For example, when talking to Congress and Parliament in the US and UK respectively, the company had to focus on different response strategies because of the legal components. So in the context of material blame, while BP did have some amount of material blame for the crisis because they owned the well, they didn't run it, nor did they directly cause the explosion. It was run by a relatively small Swiss company called Transocean, and the part that failed was produced by Halliburton, 
So the 17 or 18 safety checks and fail safes that failed and thus caused the explosion wasn't directly their responsibility. However, because they owned the well and they were the biggest company, they were put front and center in the media. So where they were in a legal context, talking about blame mitigation is responsible. But for the public sentiment, it probably weakened the effectiveness of the apology. And third, we have the Tony Hayward factor. Let's be blunt. He was a really good scientist and was put as the head of BP in the US because BP had a history of safety problems and Hayward's track record for improving safety for all the previous groups and parts of BP that he had been a part of was really good. In fact, he was brought in to manage the safety issues for the US operation. However, he wasn't a great public communicator and was rightfully labeled a gaffe machine during the crisis for a lot of errors. did it again! The BP oil spill in the Gulf continues to get worse every day. As public anger towards the BP company grows, their president released this statement. Hello, I'm Tony Haywood, president and CEO of BP. Our accidental drilling spill again in the Gulf is a tragedy that should have never happened. And to all those affected, I want to say, we are deeply sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. Sorry. BP has taken full responsibility for cleaning up the spill in the Gulf. And in doing so, we have changed our name from Beyond Petroleum to Dependable Petroleum. In the decade that's passed since the explosion, there have been a number of academic journal articles that talk about the lack of ethics in BP's crisis communication. But let me be blunt, I think they're wrong in that judgment. Because it wasn't the ethics of their response that was the problem. The problem was the perception and the company's reputation. Even in the review process for getting our article published, we spent a lot of time responding to reviewers whose argument was that they weren't persuaded by the need for the study of the structure of ethical apology because all that mattered was the public perception. Ultimately, our response was this, and this is something that I think grounds the core lessons we can learn about crisis communication, leadership, stakeholder relationship management, and corporate social responsibility. While outcomes matter in PR, research suggests that the ethical content itself is just as important as short-term perceptions because of ethical content can affect long-term image recovery and evaluations of corporate social responsibility. By conflating content and outcome, we argue that our assessments of outcomes and the application into practice is likely to be limited. And so we suggest that it can also lead to irresponsible conclusions about organizations being drawn. We would also disagree with the assessment that content is less important than outcomes. Organizations only have control over their content. This is also one of the reasons we suggest that relational approaches to evaluating crisis response are stronger than instrumental approaches, because when the problem is that the people don't believe the content, it tells us that the organization and its leaders have a relationship problem with their critical stakeholders, not that the messages themselves were wrong. So what can we say about the lessons learned from this case? First, that apology without communicating empathy fails to demonstrate remorse. Second, that wrongdoers should communicate acknowledgement, empathy, and action together for ethical apology to be credible. Third, that contextual requirements for other strategies may weaken the credibility of remorse. 
Fourth, ineffective timing, context, and source credibility all affect believability, even if the content itself is ethical. Ultimately, these are the four key lessons learned from applying the model for ethical apology to the BP case to see what went right and what went wrong. At the heart of these lessons learned is actually a concept called authenticity, which centers on stakeholders feeling like the compassion or empathy that an organization communicates has to be genuine or sincere and not just out of self-interest. This is something that we explore in the next podcast about social responsibility. And if we put these two together, provides a lot of insight into the strategy an organization uses, not only in developing its crisis response, but more broadly into making itself an ethical and responsible organization. So we'll loop back to this idea of crisis prevention, creating more options for organizations that experience crises, even transgressions. But let's explore the factors that influenced and predicted how stakeholders react to ethical apology in more detail. The core question that criticisms of looking at the content of ethical apology brought to bear was whether it was relevant if the content was ethical, but people didn't recognize it. So this was the next question it seems like needed to be asked. When ethical apology is used, will it be recognized? And what are the factors that are likely to influence that evaluation? And also, how important are they? This is where we come back to the stakeholder relationship management model to see what kinds of insights it can offer into understanding and predicting when the message strategy is likely to be successful or not. The study looked into a broad range of people from multiple cultural perspectives to try to better understand if we could identify specific factors that influenced how people would recognize and evaluate ethical apology. It turns out that based on culture, issue attitudes, industry, organizational evaluations, situation evaluation, and message evaluation, we can predict about 31% of the factors that influence how people may recognize ethical apology. Now, it may seem like we can't account for a lot, and frankly, you're not wrong, but this gives us a meaningful start into trying to really understand what lessons we can learn about VP and any organization facing a crisis. So let's take a look at how this can be applied within the stakeholder relationship model. As it turns out, there are a few critical factors influencing whether or not ethical apology is recognizable to stakeholders or not. The industry matters, and specifically if it's in the hotel or tourism industry, stakeholders are more likely to recognize and appreciate ethical apology compared to all other industries. Additionally, the relationship between the organization and issues, specifically two aspects of blame attribution, so whether the stakeholder saw this as something the organization did wrong, and whether this was the first time the organization has ever faced this problem before or not, affected how ethical apology was viewed. Second, stakeholder identity mattered who were most collectivist in their outlook and wanted to avoid uncertainty were most likely to view ethical apology favorably. So the relationship between the stakeholder and the issue was also important. Surprisingly, the relationship between the organization and the issue, so its trustworthiness, reputation, and so on, didn't matter as much with ethical apology. So how does this affect message evaluation? When ethical apology was used and it was judged to be more credible and also more contextually appropriate within the hotel and tourism industry. But it was also in situations where organizations had done something wrong, but it was their first time in doing it and where the stakeholders were more likely to have collective identity and to seek to avoid uncertainty. Big picture, ethical apology is most useful in some fairly specific contexts. First and foremost, it should only be used when there's an actual transgression, where the organization has done something wrong. Second, there isn't a specific place where it can't be used and be effective, but there are certainly types of people that it is most effective with, those who identify strongly with collective values and those people who really try to avoid uncertainty.
Third, there are manner, content, and evaluation implications to this. If we're considering that the decisions and how we communicate about those de decisions could affect our response options, both in terms of the material response to the situation, as well as the communication strategy that we use, then at what point does leadership and governance fit into manner, content, and evaluation conceptualizations? To me, it seems like when we understand the factors influencing the issue relationship and identify how that will affect what we say and also how it's construed, then when we also understand that the lack of consistency is going to be a critical determinant of the sincerity of not only our apologies, but our actions overall, then when we add in the timing, that timing is everything. If we come back to governance and leadership within organizations, it's imperative to identify the gaps to ensure that if an organization does something wrong, its apology is actually effective. And this is the greatest fault for BP. They failed to construct a crisis resistant organization. And so when they used a sound response strategy, it just wasn't effective for them, at least in the first year after the crisis. And the critical reflection on the case, as well as the multi-nation study, offers us insight into probably why that was the case. And it turns out that there's a lot more complexity, but there's some simple solutions as well.